Hello. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for organizing this panel and inviting me to participate in it. And thank you to Astria as well for having us. Although the slide says I'm a history instructor, this afternoon I'm speaking from the perspective of what botanist Edgar Anderson might have called a city watcher. Although a city watcher is a stretch since I will primarily be offering a few observations about things I in person have yet to see and things that have never yet been built. On the other hand, some of the things I um, will talk about happened at least a couple months ago. So for those of you who are up to tweeting on urban agricultural events, some of what I say might be considered ancient history. So this theme of imperfect health, as I understand it, refers to the imperfect state of our cities and by extension our country and our planet in 2012. Thank you to Jay Aronson for uh, having the illuminating population slide. Uh, the only couple of statistics I would add to that would be those along the lines of 900 million people not having enough to eat, roughly 146 million children in developing countries being underweight, contrasting that with the rates of uh, adult and juvenile uh, obesity in this country, uh, relative rates of topsoil loss um, in the United States being 10 times faster than natural for punishment, and it being uh, 30 to 40 times greater in China and India, which would be some of the places Jay is talking about rapidly growing. Uh, so many of these present and future ills are what might be considered systemic ones, and it appears that unlikely that they will be, uh, cures for them will be found in a pill, an application, or a robot. Uh, but nevertheless, by creating environments and remaking our cities, it may be possible to tackle a variety of these problems at the same time. For example, urban agriculture is considered a possible way to produce nutritious food, to reduce energy consumption, and to reduce the bite that cities take out of their hinterlands. So the idea that growing food can improve the health of city dwellers is, of course, not new. Progressive citizens in the late 19th and early 20th centuries made land available to the urban poor, hard hit by economic depressions and economic adjustments. This is a potato patch in Buffalo, uh, circa 1911. Uh, similar programs are alive and well today, um, varying on sort of very small scale things in some of Pittsburgh's neighborhoods that Carolyn uh, mentioned, uh, but also uh, 100 acre, 1,000 acre uh, farms in Detroit. Uh, but these are, I think, relatively uh, inefficient means of uh, addressing imperfect health issues in that uh, somewhat medicalized, ultra efficient greenhouses and vertical farms seem to be some of the solutions. That is, there are high-tech urban farms that are a convergence of architectural, ecological, engineering, and scientific advantages that have some uh, potential remedies for the long ailing and perhaps ever worsening uh, urban bodies around us. Uh, vertical farms are advocated, uh, for example, by Dr. Dixon de Pumier. Uh, he is a professor of public health at Columbia University. By training, he's a parasitologist. Uh, he did work in that field for about 25 years. Uh, conducting laboratory-based research on molecular aspects of intracellular parasitism. His representative publications might include immunogenicity of newborn larvae of Trichinella spiralis and the preparation and standardization of antigens useful in the diagnosis of swine Trichinella. Um, this is one of uh, de Pamier's designs of a vertical farm. He started working on these in 1999 with his medical ecology students and according to his estimates, for just a couple hundred of million dollars invested in 30-story towers, you could feed about 50,000 people. Uh, so here are just a couple of these structures. They're on his website. Uh, they're on his book if you want to look more carefully at them. Uh, but one of the things which is interesting to me about the very attractive diagrams is they're almost always shown from the outside uh, because to an untrained eye, greenhouse looks like any other greenhouse on the inside, regardless of uh, what sort of advances have been developed uh, to make them more efficient. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip over how these things, how these structures work on the inside, but sort of uh, a couple of uh, technologies employed are using recycled water throughout the entire system, uh, misters, uh, feeding the water uh, to peppers and strawberries that have been uh, filtered from a freshwater pond where there are trout, you have bees pollinating plants, chickens and pigs on different forms, uh, sorry, on different floors, all of this waste being uh, eventually collected at some point in order to fuel the building. Uh, de Pumier, as far as I know, is a champion of the farms rather than a patent holder of any of the technologies. Uh, a lot of these technologies were developed by NASA and at the Controlled Environment Agricultural Center at the University of Arizona in Tucson, uh, where basically they've uh, done uh, remarkable work in controlling plant growth and controlling environments with precision. They've developed uh, greenhouses in uh, the South Pole, for example, which can feed uh, a fresh salad to 50 to 70 people uh, for every day uh, of the year. Uh, in passing, I would like to note that de Pumier did not coin the term vertical farming. That was done by DuPont back in 1915 and elaborated by U University of Southern California geologist named Gilbert Bailey. 
rather than building upwards, vertical farming initially meant exploiting ground beneath to make new soil. Speaking of breaking new ground, the Swedish American company Plantagon, uh, Plantagon, yes, uh, perhaps named for its prototype geodesic dome, uh, has started building a 12 story plant scraper in Linkoping, Sweden, this February. Uh, its yields are estimated to be four to 120 times greater than a standard greenhouse. A newspaper article was just uh, written about it in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think this is a vertical farm that has a design where it's actually feeding um, the plants down through a chamber. So by the time it has uh, started growing at the top and it gets to the bottom, you can take it right off the tray uh, and perhaps feed some of the scientists working inside at the International Center of Excellence for Urban Agriculture. Uh, closer to ground, closer to the ground and near to Pittsburgh, here is some uh, a transitional high-tech productive farm. This is Lufa Farms in Montreal. Uh, they're able to cultivate 20-foot tall tomato plants even during Canada's frigid nights. Back on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, there, this is a hybrid farm somewhere between a rooftop greenhouse. Sorry, that's the Lufa farm is just a, a rooftop greenhouse, right? A single story as opposed to a multi-story building. Uh, this was developed by the French architecture firm SOA. It's called Urban Nanana, and there may be one person in the audience who can recognize the tropical fruit growing inside in a temperate zone. This six-story all-glass greenhouse fits between Paris's existing buildings um, and basically gives you the possibility of having uh, tropical fruit year-round in uh, temperate climates. It meets a sort of triple bottom line uh, of what uh, freshness, energy, uh, elimination, and better use of space, but it might be a few lines short of being a green bullet. Let me conclude by saying uh, that on the one hand, vertical farms can be viewed as a pointless utopian structure. On the other hand, even if the returns are not as high as hoped, a possibly profitable way of looking at them is as a healthier vision of future cities. I recently saw Soylent Green for the second time, and I have to admit that watching De Pumier talk up vertical farms is a true mood elevator after being ground up by a Hollywood Malthusian version of an urban wasteland. As, a, as magnificent as the potential productivity of grown from scratch vertical farms can be as a city watcher, what I wonder most about is how transferable the technology is to existing structures. In green architecture circles, uh, from what I understand, the idea is that uh, the most efficient building is the building which has already been built. Uh, so what potential does that raise for uh, outfitting a building like uh, the UPMC building downtown if at some point our commercial real estate sector should need uh, a booster shot uh, or an injection of medicalized tropical agriculture? I asked an urban friend, of, an architecture friend of mine that question, uh, where would he put a banana farm in Pittsburgh in this slide is what he came up with, the Golden Triangle Banana Farm. Uh, thank you for listening and sorry for speaking so rapidly, but there was no other way this was going to fit in seven minutes. Thank you.